Hey everyone, I'm Brittany Jones Cooper and welcome back to Build. Today I'm sitting down with Betsy Atkins, a serial entrepreneur and three-time CEO who has served on more than 25 public boards. In her new book, Be Board Ready, she shares the secrets to landing a board seat and being a great director. Take a look. Part of my dream is to be a catalyst to metamorphose boards so that boards become a really important contributor, an asset, and an accelerant. Not just static oversight, because there is a lot of impact and good that the board can contribute. I'm Betsy Atkins, and I've written a book called Be Board Ready. I was inspired to write this book because when I speak at conferences, there are so many questions at the end about how do I position myself? How do I uh, get considered to be on a board? And so I thought after 28 public boards, I've got a formula and I'm gonna share it. This book is for three audiences. For those who aspire and wanna join a board, for CEOs and chairmen who lead the board, and then for experienced directors to hear some of the new things that they're gonna be facing in the not too distant future. This book is really relevant today and why you need to read it now is because the boardroom has changed. The boardroom of two decades ago, one decade ago, five years ago, it's not today's boardroom. It's a different level of engagement if you're gonna add value in the boardroom today. In the back third of the book, Here's what you're gonna learn, by the way, without breaking boardroom confidentiality, how to handle the crisis, whether it's bribing a foreign official, uh, a boardroom assassination coup d'etat, uh, hashtag me too event, whatever it is, and things will go wrong, there's a way to handle it. And you have to handle it in a seven by 24 social media environment today. You can find my book by going to Amazon or go to my website, betsyatkins.com. Please help me welcome Betsy Atkins. How are you doing today? Fantastic. I feel like I'm board ready after reading this book, so thank you. I'm not going to try to be on any boards, but if I ever want to, now I'm ready. Well, why not? Oh, I just like having minimal responsibility uh, <laughs> in general. But I know there's a lot of really ambitious entrepreneurs who are going to take a lot of great things away from this book. But I want to start with you a little bit, your background, because you've done so much. So for those who maybe aren't familiar, what is your business background? It's, it's actually a pretty basic business background. I went to University of Massachusetts. I have a liberal arts degree. I came out of college and uh, I wanted to join the business world. And I found my first job at General Electric Corporation. Um, I wasn't a fit for a big structured corporation. I figured out early on entrepreneurial pursuits were my way forward. And so um, I read that sort of when you were starting your your first business is sort of your interest in boards. That's where that started. You started seeing the connection between the role of a board and a, and a business, right? When I founded my first yeah. company, you know, you write a business plan, you get investors, venture capitalists. And I thought, well, if, if it's my idea and I wrote the plan together with my co-founder, I want to be on the board. Why shouldn't I have a say? And so it was very interesting to see how a very early stage company, the, the particular challenges and business issues and how the board helps or doesn't help and how to do it better. How common is that for a CEO to be on their own board? What is that dynamic like? For public companies, almost without exception, the CEO is always a board member. In a private company, that's pretty much the same as well. And, you know, in an early stage company, you know, you might have one or two co-founders actually on the board. Gotcha. So you've served, what is it, on 27 public boards? Is that? 28 public. 28 public boards. I, I mean, was, how many private boards? Oh my gosh, well over 60. Wow. Yeah. So what is the biggest difference between the two as a board member? So, you know, in a public board, there's a certain amount of sort of uh, corporate hygiene, brushing your corporate teeth that you have to do because you report your earnings to uh, the investors. You have to have standing committees, the audit committee and the compensation committee and the governance committee. And so there's, you know, a certain amount of work that is not about the strategy and the business of the business. In a private board, it's all about, you know, what are we building? Uh, is it working? Is the market liking it or not? How do we do better? How do we execute? Do we go overseas? You know, those, you know, business issues of how you run the business are the full focus in a private board. 
And how can you serve on so many? Is there a, like, what's the most common time frame for somebody to serve on a board? Because if you've served on over 60, obviously they weren't at the same time. Right. So, you know, venture capitalists typically would sit on 10 to 12 corporate boards at any one time that are the investments that they put money in. And it's more and more common now on a private board that you would bring an independent director. And if you live in Silicon Valley, which I did for a long time, you know, they're all right there in the 408, you know, area code. You're, you're not going, they don't even leave the state of California, a good number of the venture capitalists. So they won't even leave the 408. Maybe they'll go to 415 in San Francisco, go from San Jose up. So you, um, you can do a lot simultaneously. Um, as a public board member, there, there are sort of governance watchdogs, and they, they really frown if you do more than five public boards at one time. So let's talk about how to get on one of these boards. And I love the book is sort of designed for people who want to be on a board, and then you sort of talk about people who are on boards and how to operate and some of the things that happen. So starting at the beginning, you, you really talk about building your brand and how important it is to sort of know your worth and your strengths. Uh, what do you tell people who are interested in sort of building that brand? So to join a board, you need to think about what is it that you're going to bring to this company to move the company forward. And if you can't answer how I'm going to accelerate this business, then why would they want you? So that's the first question. You know, how am I going to add to this company? You know, is my domain knowledge in advertising or marketing going to move them forward? Is my technology knowledge, you know, on using artificial intelligence and, and you know, machine learning going to move this? You know, what is it that I know that's going to help this business? So that's number one. And then number two uh, you have to really think of it as if you're the thought partner with the CEO. You know, you have to, in your mind's eye, when your head hits the pillow, kind of be moving in three dimensions, this Gordian knot of, how do I make this business better? And if you're not obsessed and excited, then, you know, it's probably not the right gig for you. Yeah. And how does one even go about applying to be on a board? Or do you have to be recommended? What is that process like? How important is your network in getting on a board? It's a really good question, and it's critical. So there's lots of pathways. The obvious one is through the executive search, the recruiters. But why are they going to find you? And you know, how do you make yourself visible? So I think the, the first thing you need to think about is how you're branding yourself. You know, because if you're just a generalist, it's hard to stand out. So, you know, are you uh, the, the person who is, you know, brilliant at the supply chain so that you never run out of the components and you know how to take cost out of building something? You know, at Amazon, the supply chain is what makes it so competitive that they can deliver to you so quickly. So, you know, are you amazing at that? What is it that you're really great at? And how would that fit in? And how do you get that message out there is the next piece. And then, of course, there are recruiters. There's your boss. There's your colleagues. There's your network of people. But you have to kind of prove to them that they should recommend you. How do you know as an individual when you're ready for that next step to join a board? Is there like a certain amount of time and experience? Or is it just kind of based on where you're at? Well, you know, if, if you think that you can really help a business, you can start small. Start with private, small boards and get, you know, experience at that. A lot of times people start in the not-for-profit world and then go to smaller private boards. I mean, it's sort of unlikely if you've never done anything related at all that, you know, American Express is going to tap you on the shoulder or that Google is going to call you. You know, so you have to kind of build up your portfolio. I want to talk now about building a board um, because this is the thing I probably hear m the most about are kind of the lack of diversity on a board. So what is that selection process like for m most corporations? What are they thinking of when they're choosing people to be on their board? So diversity is an interesting word. So, you know, what you really want is a variety of how people think and problem solve. So I think you want cognitive diversity because if everybody looks the same and has the same background and the same experience, then they see the same opportunity and they miss the same risk, right? Because it's like astigmatism. Everyone's looking with the same, you know, thing on their eyeball. So you, you want cognitive diversity, certainly gender diversity, 
ethnic diversity. I think you want geographic diversity. You know, all corporations in the U.S. do about you know, 55% of their revenue outside America. So I think you want that. Uh, and then you want skill diversity. You want people who have financial background, the specific industry background, technology background. You want a range of, of skills so that, you know, collegially with the eight to 10 people around the table, you're able to kind of see the future, identify the risks, and, you know, add value to the company. Do you think that's happening? in the US with boards? Do you think that they're having that sort of di cognitive diversity and looking at things sort of a little more holistically than they used to? Improving? Not there yet. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd say, you know, we lag um, in, in what we need to get to because I think people get on a board, they don't want to give up the gig. And, you know, the rate of change in a company, 50% of all companies, they disappear in a decade. It's unbelievable. So, you know, think of all the companies you know. Half of them are going to not exist as independent companies. So with that rate of change, you need to refresh your board more often because everyone's using a stale playbook. And, you know, you need to have the skills for the sort of part of the journey the company is on. If you're going from 50 million to 200 million, that's a journey. If you're going from 1 billion to 2 billion, it's it's a different journey. So you want people who've been on that, that journey. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of gender diversity, I read something that the UK actually has this new law in place that I think 33% of their boards have to be female by 2021. Um, where is the US on that? I know California has some legislation saying something similar. But as far as like increasing the female representation, how do you think US boards are doing compared to Europe? We're lagging. Uh, so it started first in um, Europe, in Scandinavia, and moved to Italy and France and Germany, where they mandate 40%. Uh, UK did sort of a slightly diluted 30, 33%. Uh, we're today on um, public corporate boards, like the Fortune 500. Um, we're probably around 24 four, 25%. But if you look at the new seats, like there's a vacancy, 80% um, of all new searches are profiled for women. What has your experience been like as a woman on boards? Is it something that is a, a topic of conversation or are you just in there doing business? You know, I've been doing it a while. So uh, it, in, in the beginning, I was the only woman in the boardroom. And I used to think, how crazy is this, right? It's a cosmetics company. It's a women's apparel company, and there aren't any women here. And, you know, the men are talking about how the brassiere is going to fit. And it's like, no, you don't really get it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it depends on the industry. You see more women coming earlier into certain industries, consumer industries, heavy industry, less so. What was it that empowered you to just step forward and be bold enough to do that? You mentioned there weren't a lot of women on these boards. Did you have any mentors or anybody who helped encourage you to do those things? Well, I think absolutely everybody, if they want to, should go for it. You know, why would you self-limit? You know, you sh if you have a dream and you want to go for it, have the courage to try, be tenacious, be focused, and, you know, why not you? Of course you could do it. Um, and... You know, I didn't actually have any mentors now, but it's interesting. There's not only a lot of women mentoring groups, but there's groups like Him For Her and, you know, groups that are helping to reach down and, and get women onto boards. But I think you can create and develop relationships with your colleagues and your boss who will mentor you and then sponsor you. The difference being is mentoring, you call me, we have a, a chat now and again. Sponsoring is, I say, I call up um, Verizon and I say to the board of directors, Brittany's ready. You need someone from media. You should put Brittany on the board. I'm sponsoring you. I'm making the call as opposed to I'm just coaching you, which would be mentoring. But Betsy, don't do that. I told you I don't want any more. You're ready. I don't want any more responsibility. <laughs> like I'm really, I'm good right here where I am. <laughs> um, I just, I, I asked that question because I would imagine, and I read something that, you know, you can put one woman on a board, but really it's not until there's two or three that those voices are really kind of recognized and heard. It's Have true. you had that experience? It's true. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and, and I do think that um, the bridge building and some of the softer skills that women bring uh, 
are very helpful, when, particularly when there's a disagreement. And yes, I think whenever you get two or three people it resonates. So, for example, uh, my background's all in tech. When I'm the only, quote, digital director, and I'm talking about AI and ML and the data lake, they're, look, they're glazing, and they're like, what are you talking about? And I say digital transformation, and they can't turn their cell phones on. So, it's, you know, no. Uh, so you need to have two or three people to actually start to influence effectively. Yeah. I think you're right. And typical board size is 10 to 11, up to 12. Yeah. So we need more women, two or three. Well, at least, right? Well, that's our goal. Right. We're, we're going to get... I, America's going to catch up in the, very shortly, and I'll tell you why. So if you look at a big company like Apple, Google, Verizon, about 80% of the stock that's bought and sold is owned by these big index funds. That's Vanguard, Fidelity, State Street Global Advisors, BlackRock, Blackstone, you know, these big funds. And they have very strict governance guidelines. And two years ago, they started doing withhold. In other words, I won't give you a positive vote. I am withholding my vote unless you add more women. And that was a huge catalyst because there's only, if 80% of your stock is held by you know 10 or 12 of these companies and they say to do something, mm -hmm. you're going to do it. Absolutely. And of course, we know uh, boards are not scandal free. Uh, and when they do make news, it's usually really big and really bad. And so your book offers some really helpful tools, I think, to board directors on how to navigate this, this landscape. Uh, one specifically was around social media, which I thought was really interesting, about sort of preparing social media responses to like your top 10 possible tragedies, I guess, or like horrible things that could happen to your company. Why is that important? So, you know, in the past, it's called disaster recovery and enterprise risk management. That's what the audit committee does. They look at what are the risks to the company. So in the past, it was like, oh, there's a hurricane in Florida, and are you connected to more than one grid? Will the data center work? That no longer is what people are worried about. So now it's what bad, embarrassing thing could occur, and what are we going to do about it? So here's the example of good and the example of bad. So good is Starbucks, accused of you know, racial profiling. They immediately do a half-day training for everybody. It enhances the brand. It costs the shareholders in the company about $7 million. You couldn't buy that much good press and brand loyalty. Fabulous. Responsive. They, they respond right away. They care. They're genuine. Okay, that's good. Bad. United Airlines. So they drag the passenger off, and nobody in the United Board probably even knows because they're not connected to social media, and the company is hierarchical. And by the time they find out 18 hours later, they've lawyered up, and the lawyers you know, give them this very sort of measured response about we had to receipt the passenger. Yeah, you didn't receipt him. And you know, you dragged him off, and everybody, you know, remembers that you just suffocated a puppy two weeks earlier, and you didn't seem to actually care. So, you know, you've, you've just destroyed the brand value. So here's the learnable moment. Stuff's going to go wrong. You can't lawyer up. That's, you know, last decade's playbook. You have to be ready. So figure out what are the 10 things that would go wrong. So let's say you're a restaurant. What could go wrong? Um, a mass shooting, that would be very bad. Uh, food poison, everybody. Um, contaminate the supply chain. Um, uh, cyber breach, lose everybody's data. So, you know, there's a list, and the thing that goes wrong isn't the 10 you thought, but have the CEO practice and pre vet, pre record, be genuine, be human, be authentic, and don't call the lawyers, you know, and, and care. and be transparent because everybody knows when you're hiding stuff and you know it's all out there in social media it's not like people aren't going to know so fess up own it and and care about it and tell them what you're going to do and then go do it at, when you said you would have you been on a board where something like scandalous happened and how did you deal with that i have seen a few kerfuffles <laughs> uh I think my favorite one, and I, and I tell this story because I just can't believe it really happened. Um, if you can recall uh, WorldCom and the meltdown there, uh, and Enron and those companies, they, they went 
you know, bankrupt. And that started this whole sort of focus on the board. So right after that, everybody was very worried. And I was on the board of this rocket ship tech company called UT Starcom. So UT Starcom, it's like a $6 billion company, has a very high multiple. The stock's a high flyer. And, you know, we aren't forward hiring and forward building our team quickly enough. And the guy running engineering comes and says, hey, I want to be a general manager. Can't you let me do a rotation to another position? Sure, okay, go to Miami and hire the VP of South Central America uh, and, and the Caribbean. He goes, he's an engineering VP. He interviews three guys. He picks a guy, doesn't do a background check. The guy's a convicted felon. Felon one hires felon two and felon three. Uh, they cook up a deal with Haiti. And this was a company that sold um, modular small um, wireless base stations for cell phones in small areas. So Haiti's a small place. And the two felons, they go, they find Aristide's brother-in-law. They cook up a deal to take the $50,000 piece of equipment, sell it for 300000 and they're going to split the cash. And the whistleblower, Secretary Miami, calls and says, something very bad is happening. The board flies down to investigate, and yeah, there is a bag of cash. Unbelievable. We intercept it. we righteously indignant. We call in the felons, and uh, we say, you know, you're, you're really bad, and we're going to fire you. And they say, no, you're not. You're going to pay us each a million in severance. They blackmail us. Why, why would we do that? They said, well you know, WorldCom, Enron, we're going to tank your stock by about 65, 70%. We'll go to the Wall Street Journal. We'll say you have no internal controls and you're incompetent. Or you could pay us the severance and we'll go away. Because, you know, we're felons and, you know, this is what we do. And we were, we were spinning in circles, right? We can't pay these guys. And so the reaction is, you know, let's go call the police. Let's turn them in. This is outrageous. But then you remember... The board of directors works for the shareholders. We have only three duties, technical legal duties, a duty of care to be careful and thoughtful, a duty of loyalty. We owe the loyalty to the shareholders. We're not in law enforcement. And to make a business judgment based on those two duties. So tanking the stock by 65%, you know, for all the shareholders, that isn't the right business decision. Now, if you're in law enforcement, it's a different decision. But if So sometimes you have to make these really hard decisions. So we negotiated a much lower severance. It was $80,000. We held our nose. We threw up. We paid them. And, you know, we didn't destroy the stock value. But it's an interesting moral and business ethics question, right? Because, you know, your moral compass says, I'm not going to be blackmailed. It's outrageous. Uh, and then you have to put your business hat on, your director hat on, where you represent the shareholders, and make that hard decision. Oh, that was like an ABC primetime drama. It was. I'd watch that show any week. Uh, yeah. It, that's there, fascinating. There's a few others, but yeah, uh, that's, really that, that's a colorful one because <laughs> it was an interesting you know, dilemma. A moral dilemma. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Wow, you should write books just about that. Yeah, no, no, no. One will, no one will let me back in the boardroom. This company is out of business and gone, so it's okay. That's fair. Well, before we go, we do have a couple of questions. Our first one comes from Twitter. Kiki Cat XOXO wants to say, Hi, Betsy. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received thus far in your career? The best piece of advice I ever received was not to give up, to be determined, to be tenacious, to be focused. Uh, and, you know, if you fail... It's only a failure if you don't get back up off your knees. One question, two questions. Hi, Betsy. Hi. Uh, my name is Danny. And uh, my question, you've spoken to it somewhat, but um, basically in your experience, what do you really feel it is to be a powerful woman in such a patriarchal landscape? You know, I, I think that you have to be willing to sort of put that aside or call someone out, you know, if they behave inappropriately. And it's always better to do that sort of privately and let them not lose face. But if needed, you have to say, gee, you know, that doesn't really seem like the right way to handle or, or speak about this or whatever. 
And if people make rude remarks, you just have to say, hey, that's unkind and that's rude. You can do better. Next question. Hi. Uh, we have a question from our site, buildseries.com. Uh, they were wondering, what's the biggest challenge you have to face in your job? The biggest challenge you face is figuring out what are the sort of top three things that move a business forward. Because, you know, everybody has a list uh, of, you know, 27 things they're going to do, just like the CEO does in the company. But there's only like two or three really hard things that really move the business, that are the really hard ones that you have to focus on. And figuring out what those are and getting that actually onto the table for discussion is the hardest thing because it's so easy and gratifying to do the easier ones. Well, like I said, this book is so chock full of really helpful tips. Um, and it's so, it's so easily digestible, I think, was my favorite part, that I felt like I had this understanding of a world that before now felt very foreign, foreign and very separate. I think boards are sort of seen as this like elitist thing, but the way you broke it down, it's like, oh, if you work towards a path, it's really attainable for a lot of people, definitely. It definitely is. And there isn't anybody, if they are determined and really care about a business, you know, that they can't be in that role of being an advisor and helping to be an accelerant for the company. Yeah, definitely. We all want to be in the room where it happens and you're in you're helping with that. So if you guys want to pick up a copy, Be Board Ready is available now wherever books are sold. Give it up for Betty Atkins. Thank you.